The empty streets of Jerusalem tell their own story of trouble. Terrorism here, as in Jaffa and Tel Aviv, has been the chief outward sign of a critical situation. This picture was taken soon after a gang of Jewish terrorists had made an attack on police headquarters in the center of Jerusalem, shooting it up with automatics and blowing it up with HE. The new High Commissioner, General Sir Alan Cunningham, in Mufti, is seen inspecting the scene of the outrage in which three men lost their lives and a number were seriously injured. The funeral was conducted with solemn dignity after strict precautions had been taken throughout the city. A solution to the Palestine problem has still to be found. At present, Palestine contains about a million Arabs and half as many Jews. Jewish immigration continues at a fixed monthly rate, but the problem surely calls for settlement on the international level. The King David Hotel itself. It was in the wing on the right of the picture that the terrorists placed their explosive. And the result of the crime, the tragic scene, is like a serious incident during the Blitz. The hotel housed the British Army headquarters and the Palestine government offices, and casualties were very heavy. Sixty-five deaths are reported, and there is little or no hope of survival for any of the 58 missing. Nearly 50 others were injured. The Jewish terrorist organization, Irgun Zwei Leomi, openly admitted responsibility for the bombing. Many arrests have been made. Leaders of the Jewish agency have expressed horror at the dastardly crime perpetrated by a gang of desperados. Mr. Attlee in the House of Commons declared, the British government will not be diverted by acts of violence in their search for a just and final solution of the Palestine problem. President Truman, condemning the wanton act of terrorism, added that America and Britain are conferring on steps to be taken to implement the report of the Anglo-American Palestine Committee. Undoubtedly, the people of Britain anxiously wait for the announcement of a policy which will prevent the loss of any more innocent lives. Following the King David Hotel outrage, the military authorities in Jerusalem imposed the most rigorous curfew yet known in the city. The streets are full until just on six o'clock when crowds can be seen on their way home. Keeping an eye on the time, people pause on their doorstep, then curfew. Barriers are drawn across all street corners and roads leading into the city are closed. All civilians found in the streets of Jerusalem after six are stopped and unless they have special passes entitling them to be out, they are rounded up and detained in custody overnight. City life, in fact, comes to a full stop at curfew time, and the only visible signs of activity are the patrols. The curfew is not, of course, intended to be a mere measure of repression. It's just one obvious precaution against further terrorism in the focal point of the still unsolved problem of Palestine. Curfew in Tel Aviv, where for four days a whole division, including airborne troops, carried out the most determined measures ever taken against terrorism in Palestine. During the course of the curfew, a house-to-house -house search was made with the object of interviewing every single inhabitant. Tel Aviv has long been suspected as one of the main terrorist hideouts. Apart from the search for wanted men, a thorough search for weapons was carried out and several big halls were made. One large cache was discovered in a school. All sorts of weapons were found, rifles, ammunition, mortars, grenades, automatics. An oscillograph, indicating up-to-date radio equipment. A dummy Luger pistol of solid aluminium casting, useful for purposes of intimidation, no doubt and stolen uniforms of many types. The discovery of these illegally held weapons would alone have made the curfew worthwhile, but a large number of suspects were also rounded up and taken to checking centers for further questioning and detention.
curfew was complete, except for a brief break at five o'clock when the people were allowed out to buy food. Even then, very strict precautions were taken, for this was obviously a likely time for gunmen to get to work. Our picture shows the people going to the shops and forming queues to obtain their supplies for the day. As to the general situation and the Palestine problem itself, it didn't seem at the time this film arrived that a solution was yet in sight. Palestine continues to present one of the most obstinate problems of today, and in view of the insistent threats of terrorist outrage, Jerusalem now presents a picture of a city of barbed wire. The defensive measures, in fact, provide evidence of preparedness such as could scarcely have been seen even at the height of... The police have to be very strict about examining passes and searching visitors to government buildings. Obviously, no chances can be taken while the present deplorable situation exists. Tension is most marked nor does a solution to the problem appear to be in sight as yet. Recently, a raid was made by the army on the little seaside village of Sedot Yam, not far from Haifa. All the villagers, about 130, were rounded up and interrogated, the object being to find out whether this Jewish settlement had been involved in the attack by frogmen on the deportation ship Empire Rival, which had been damaged at Haifa by limpet mines. One of Movietone's cameramen made a few notes of the thoroughness with which the search among the homes of this fishing community was carried out. To supplement the work of more orthodox mine detectors, about a dozen well-trained army dogs were brought along to see if they could sniff out any mines or explosives. Failure to discover anything at the time did not entirely allay suspicion. At the communal settlement of Ruama in southern Palestine, however, paratroops of the 6th Airborne Division did make a discovery. After a three-day search, they unearthed an arms dump, cleverly concealed in a hole underneath a chicken house. As you see, it was a pretty good haul. All sorts of weapons, a three-inch mortar, German machine guns, plenty of grenades, stens and automatics, as well as demolition and other equipment. Tel Aviv was the scene of the first dynamiting outrage since the King David Hotel blow up. Now the area security office has been wrecked on the night of September the 9th, resulting in the death of the security officer, a British major, serious injuries to his wife, and the deaths of another British soldier and an Arab policeman who was on guard outside at the time. The aftermath provided pictures which are by now becoming familiar. The roundup of suspects, their interrogation and detention. Terrorists have recently committed other outrages, including the shooting of a British sergeant. Threats of more equally deliberate murders continue to be made by the Jewish terrorist organization. At the port of Haifa, military precautions, a barbed wire entanglement to protect the court where a trial is being held. There's heavy arm protection in fear of an outbreak, as Zionist extremists are brought in chains. They were captured in the blowing up of the Haifa Railroad Yards. They were taken after a battle in which most of them were wounded. There are 20 young men on trial and four young women. One with plaster casts on both arms. Since then, death sentence has been decreed for the men, life imprisonment for the women. New crisis in Palestine. At the docks, meanwhile, the drama of the illegal immigrant ships continues. Jewish refugees from Europe are brought ashore to be transferred to vessels to take them on to Cyprus for internment there. Their dilemma, the question of immigration, is the immediate cause for the conflict in Palestine. They are for a brief time in the Holy Land and then must go. There's tense emotions. He kisses the ground, Zion, for which he has longed and now must leave. The tragedy of people caught in the toils of international forces. Jews who must go into exile again until there has been an international settlement. Members of the Arab Legion were well in the picture at the recent reopening of the Alamde Bridge across the Jordan near Jericho. 
The bridge had been blown up by terrorists on the 17th of last July. It was quick work to have it repaired and open again so soon. As it's the main road link between Jerusalem and the capital of Transjordan, its importance is obvious. The new structure was carefully tested for strains and stresses by leaving five Sherman tanks on it and making an examination. Then heavy traffic was allowed to cross and the bridge was declared OK. In Haifa, one of our cameramen filmed this demonstration on its way to the district commissioner's office. A crowd of workers were mourning the death of an illegal immigrant who had lost his life after arrival in the Palma. They also complained that he had not yet been buried. The crowd was stopped by troops and ordered to disperse. They refused to do so for some time, but eventually wiser counsel prevailed and the more moderate members succeeded in bringing an end to the demonstration. Jerusalem was the scene of more outrages following immediately upon the Zionist Council's condemnation of the terrorists. Bombs placed in the railway station resulted in the loss of more British lives. Two soldiers and a police sergeant were killed and a number of others were injured, some of them very seriously. Shortly before the explosions, a girl had driven up in a taxi and deposited several suitcases in the station and although the British sergeant removed one of them, the other two blew up when he was taking them out and killed him instantly. Though the girl escaped at the time, her car and another one were fired upon by police and troops. Here's one of the cars which was shot up, and some of the men arrested for alleged complicity in the murderous attack. They are all reported to be of Polish origin. This was the scene of premeditated murder in Jerusalem, in a ruined house where three British policemen were killed outright. The third, a sergeant, was terribly wounded and has since died as the result of his wound. Crowds, who our cameraman stresses, showed no signs of horror, watched while wounded and dead were taken away. The three men were literally blown to pieces when a so-called booby trap went off while they were searching the house in response to a phone message that arms were concealed there. Our film of the aftermath of this brutal outrage is admittedly distressing, but it's surely right that everyone, and not only in Britain, should appreciate to the full what innocent British police officials and others are facing in Palestine. Murders such as these are now threatened against various people in Britain as well.